Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Alyssa Ayers and I'm Dean of the Elliott School of International Affairs. I am very pleased to welcome you to another event in our book launch series. It's the first of our spring semester series. As most of you know, this series offers a special opportunity to the GW community and to the public to meet our award-winning faculty and to hear in their own words about the issues and conflicts their respective books explore. Today, we are here to discuss Professor Alex Downs' latest book, Catastrophic Success, Why Foreign Imposed Regime Change Goes Wrong. Professor Downs is Associate Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at the George Washington University. He is also co-director of the Institute for Security and Conflict Studies in the Elliott School of International Affairs. His research has appeared in numerous journals and edited volumes. His first book, Targeting Civilians in War, won the Joseph Leipgold Prize awarded by Georgetown University for the best book in international relations published in 2008. Professor Downs has held fellowships at Harvard University, the Olin Institute for Strategic Studies and Stanford University. And his work has been funded by the Department of Defense's Minerva Institute, the Carnegie Corporation, and the Office of Naval Research, among many others. He has also been recognized with numerous awards, including the most prestigious award the Elliott School confers, the 2020 Harry Harding Teaching Prize given to a member of the Elliott School faculty who demonstrates sustained excellence in teaching and who has made extraordinary contributions to the education of Elliott School students. Professor Downs holds a BA in music from Brown University and an MA in international relations and PhD in political science, both from the University of Chicago, a great place. Today's event will be moderated by Professor David Edelstein, Vice Dean of Faculty at Georgetown College and a professor in the Department of Government at the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service and the Center for Security Studies at Georgetown University. Now, Professor Downs' book, Catastrophic Success, Why Foreign Imposed Regime Change Goes Wrong, uses both quantitative analysis and extensive case studies to demonstrate the after effects that regime change has on targeted countries such as civil war and unrest and on the relations between the two states involved. This is a theoretical book, but it has immediate practical policy world application. As he argues, political leaders often believe they can get rid of troublesome or threatening leaders by trying to replace them with leaders who share their own preferences and that doing so, that this change will improve relations and effectively be permanent. But as this book argues, this view neglects to take account of predictable yet unintended consequences of enforced regime change that the book outlines in great detail. The case studies here reinforce the argument that overthrowing a government is often the easy part and it's what comes next that's difficult. Professor Downs looks at more than 120 cases over nearly two centuries from 1816 to 2011 to develop and test his propositions. One of these, Afghanistan, appears six times in his accounting. So I'm gonna follow up later with a more specific question about that, but suffice it to say that even with the best of intentions in cases of a right to protect driven by human rights concerns or a desire to support democratization, the findings in catastrophic success should serve as a caution from foreign imposed regime change. So with that brief overview, I will hand the floor over to Professor Downs for his presentation. I look forward to hearing more into the moderated discussion to follow. Thank you all for being here and over to you, Professor Downs. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Ayers, uh, for uh, that really kind introduction. Um, I want to also thank Professor David Edelstein uh, for being here today to moderate, um, and especially all of you uh, for coming to take an hour out of your day to hear about uh, regime change. Um, if my parents actually made it onto the call, I'd like to thank them. Obviously, none of this would be possible uh, without them. Uh, so thanks uh, for joining. And also uh, my wife, who I think is joined from across the hall. Um, uh, there was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that went into this book, and no one knows that more than she does. So thank you, uh, Lisa. All right, let me uh, start with the sort of puzzle here in the questions, right? So this book, like many books, uh, has its origins in the Iraq War of 2003. I was writing my dissertation, and I remember watching on TV as the first tanks and airstrikes uh, went into Iraq uh, and thought, 
maybe this isn't such a good idea. Um, and that really got me interested in the causes and the consequences of regime change. And uh, I started looking into this and after a, a hilarious and infuriating meeting with my ex-dissertation advisor, uh, uh, I really focused in on the consequences uh, of regime change. And that required, for me, I like to look at both cases in depth and the broader universe of cases. So I started looking around, I found about a, 120 of these over the last couple of centuries. And I saw a lot of similarities, unfortunately, to what happened in Afghanistan and Iraq, but also some positive outcomes. And so that prompted the two questions that I ask in this book. One is, why do foreign imposed regime changes so often go off the rails? And I specifically look at three outcomes. One is the relationship between the intervener and the target afterwards. Does it improve? Does it stay the same? Does it get worse? Uh, the second is things that violent outcomes inside the target state. Does regime change kind of wreck the state? And I look there at civil war and at the, the survival of the leader that's put in power. Do they actually stay in power? And so for my remarks today, I'm gonna to mainly focus on the first one of those, but I'll touch uh, also on the second as I go along. So what I first wanna do is briefly define what I mean uh, by foreign imposed regime change. I'm gonna use the shortcut of regime change since foreign imposed regime change is a bit of a mouthful and FERC can be a bit of an awkward acronym. Um, I'll explain briefly how people often think that regime change is supposed to work before showing where things can go wrong and talking about the two principal mechanisms that my theory identifies to try and explain why that is. And then a quick overview of the empirics in the book, which will necessarily be kind of a drive-by given uh, the, the time. And now I'll say a little bit about the implications of the, of the argument and findings. So what is this thing called foreign imposed regime change? I define it as the forcible or coerced removal of the effective, that is the de facto leader uh, in charge of a state by the government of another state. So there's really three conditions here to qualify that are, are in that statement. One is that the target is already an independent state uh, this is not decolonization, for example. Uh, second, the target remains nominally independent. Uh, yes, it can be occupied for a while, but it's not like you conquer it and incorporate it into your state or empire. Uh, and third, that the outside actor is principally primarily or primarily responsible for the ouster of the government. They can do that in one of three ways. One is direct use of force, invasion, for example. Uh, the second is coercive threats, uh, get out or else, we'll do something. Uh, and then third is to work in tandem or together with domestic actors uh, inside the target state, either overtly or covertly. Um, and so that yielded a set of 120 leaders that were removed over this long time period. Uh, as you might have guessed, the United States is the, the leader uh, the all-time record holder in removing foreign leaders by quite a margin, 33 of those cases are done by the United States, followed by the Soviet Union, Russia, Britain, Germany, France, and then in sixth place, you'd never guess Guatemala, uh, which removed a bunch of its neighbors' regimes during the 19th century. Very interesting set of cases. Uh, the most popular targets, uh, as Dean Ayers mentioned, Afghanistan, half a dozen times, but they're not actually the, the most common target. That's Honduras, uh, most of the time at the hands of its fellow Central American countries, not actually the United States. OK, so having gotten that on the table, how is this supposed to work? Well, it's deceptively simple, right? It seems like a simple idea. The idea is that an, an intervening state, an outside power, can get rid of a troublesome, threatening, uh, otherwise pain in the neck kind of leader by replacing them with someone else who shares their own preferences or right, uh, is willing to do uh, what they want. Um, and so you sort of start out with a preference divergence, replace the leader or government with somebody else. Uh, that brings your preferences together, your interests together, and lo and behold, you have peaceful relations afterwards. 
that's the idea. Um, you'll notice that, that this sort of simple set of propositions has a bunch of assumptions baked into it. The first is that you can do this regime change without breaking the state uh, in some way, without it coming apart at the seams. The second is that the people you choose to put in power actually do share your preferences. Uh, they may not always. Um, the third is that, and very important, is that there's no impediment that gets in the way of the new leader doing what you would like them to do. Uh, so domestic politics, domestic actors inside the target state get assumed away. And then finally, that when you seek to build new institutions, if you choose to do that, that doing so succeeds. And, but we know that that is not necessarily always the case. So these kinds of uh, assumptions point directly to my arguments about what can go wrong here. First, regime change does uh, sometimes require invasion and invasion sometimes uh, weakens the state so much that uh, you get an insurgency or a civil war right away or resistance to your occupation. Um, the second is that the leader you install may not actually share your preferences. We call this uh, adverse selection as I'll talk about it in a minute. The third is that uh, what if the preferences or desires of actors groups inside the state are not aligned uh, with yours, the outside intervener. That implies there might be pushback uh, against your chosen leader implementing your, your interests. Uh, and finally, uh, leaders, of course, want to survive, right? We, the biggest assumption we make is that leaders like to remain in power. Uh, and so they're going to respond to constituencies that can threaten their survival. Uh, and it might be that both the outsiders and the insiders can do that. So the two mechanisms that my theory focuses on are directly related to these, uh, these sort of difficulties with regime change. One, the first is called military disintegration. So this applies only to regime changes that are carried out by invasion for the most part. And it applies to the first uh, uh, the civil war insurgency uh, outcome primarily. So sometimes when you attack another state and defeat it militarily, the army uh, surrenders in an organized fashion. Uh, you can intern it, disarm it, uh, and so forth, and it doesn't pose a, a continuing threat. Other times, however, uh, the target military escapes, blows up, disintegrates, runs away, uh, flees to the hills, to the mountains, uh, across an international border, uh, and immediately can serve as uh, uh, fuel for a potential insurgency. Say, for example, if the leader gets away uh, that you're trying to depose, that leader can rally those troops to fight back uh, in a guerrilla fashion later on. But even if the leader uh, is apprehended, say Saddam Hussein's case, uh, eventually, uh, other officials in the former regime uh, can rally uh, and uh, lead an attempt to get back uh, in power. So it at, this, at once creates the motive uh, for fighting back because you've just thrown somebody out of power. Boy, do they usually want to get it back. Uh, and so that's the motive. And then it creates the opportunity with this, uh, this uh, uh, materiel, right, these former fighters uh, that are available to carry that out. Um, so there are plenty of examples of this. Iraq and Afghanistan are two. Another one I focus on is Cambodia, uh, the Vietnamese invasion of Cambodia in 1978-79, where the Khmer Rouge flee, uh, a lot of them do, to the Thai border. Paul Pot and the Khmer Rouge leadership join up with them, uh, and they are able to fight against the Vietnamese occupation for 10 or 12 years. Um, Libya, of course, is also a more recent example. So that's mechanism number one, military disintegration. The second one uh, is what I call the problem of competing principles. And so the idea here is that regime change sets up a principal agent problem, right? So the principal being the intervener and the agent being the leader that's put in power. So this idea is very simple, right? So if I wanna say repair a hole in my roof, 
I'm not very good at that. So I'm going to hire an agent to do it for me and I'm going to pay them. And I want them to do a great job at a low cost and do it quickly before the next rainstorm. Uh, they, on the other hand, would like to get paid well for not doing a lot of work. Uh, and so the interests there are always going to be not quite aligned. Um, and so what's happening in regime change is that the, the intervener ends up delegating uh, governance of the state to an agent, right? A, a leader that they put in power. And these kinds of relationships uh, are plagued by what we call agency loss, which is simply the, the mismatch or, or the, the difference between what you would have done had it been you or your desired outcome and what the, the agent does or wants to do. And so there's four things that kind of float around in here. I'll just focus on two for right now. One is the adverse selection problem. Like people you choose might, you might not be able to tell that they're not really up for the job. Uh, and so the, the agent that you put in power is not well suited to doing the job. The second one that I'll focus on primarily is interest asymmetry, right? The interests of the intervener and their agents diverge, even if they were pretty similar to begin with. Over time, what had been convergence can become divergence. So the sort of causal chain here is that interveners overthrow foreign governments in pursuit of their own interests for the most part. They impose a new ruler to safeguard those interests or implement their preferences. But the intervener is not the only principle uh, that's trying to control the agent. There's this other thing called the domestic population uh, or domestic groups inside the target country that's also has its own ideas uh, that tries to control the agent. So because the interests of those two, the intervener and the domestic population usually diverge uh, and both can threaten the survival of the leader, the leader then is, faces a dilemma, right? So pursuing policies favored by the intervener may trigger domestic resistance and unrest and attempts to oust that leader. But on the flip side, pursuing policies so shifting and responding to that domestic population can anger the intervener, who may then go after that leader, try to replace them with somebody else, sponsor a coup against them, uh, and so forth. So uh, this is really encapsulated in one of my favorite Far Side cartoons, which of course dates me uh, a lot, where there's a, a guy standing in front of two doors with the devil behind him with his you know, sort of pitchfork poked in his back. The first door says, damned if you do. The other door says, damned if you don't. And the devil says, come on, just pick one. Um, this is the dilemma that leaders uh, are faced with. Okay, so the implications of all this is that military disintegration can lead to immediate insurgency and civil war. The problem of competing principles can cause civil war, leader overthrow, or interstate problems, depending on which of those constituencies the leader responds to, right? If they respond to uh, the domestic population, they may have conflict with the intervener and vice versa. So those are the three outcomes that I'm looking at, which are also implications of the argument. So very quickly, how do I do this in the book? The rest of the book is set up to kind of investigate these relationships between regime change and civil war, regime change and imposed leader survival in office, and the relations between the intervener and the target. Uh, as Dean Ayers mentioned, each of those chapters has a, has a quantitative component that analyzes this group of cases that I collected over time to get a sense of whether there's correlations between regime change and these outcomes that I'm looking at across a broad number of cases and a series of case studies, right? To look inside the cases and see whether what's happening is happening for the reason that my theory suggests, right? This mismatch of interests or this military disintegration. So a quick overview of the chapters. Um, chapter three studies the effect of regime change on the occurrence of civil wars uh, within the target state uh, after 
in the decade after regime change. And the basic bottom line is that regime change increases the likelihood of civil war over that ensuing decade by quite a lot, actually. Uh, and depending on the kind of regime change that's implemented, this is part of my argument that helps to explain variation in outcomes uh, among regime changes, ones that impose simply impose leaders, right? They sort of exchange one leader for another leader uh, and don't do much in the way of building institutions. Those are the worst. They increase the likelihood of civil war the most. Trying to build institutions, uh, institutional regime change, I call that, uh, has a more mixed effect, um, but it tends to only have a good effect when you succeed at building the institutions, right? When democratization, for example, uh, succeeds. Um, that's when uh, civil war is unlikely, but when it fails, as it often does, then civil war is more likely. And the last category of regime changes I talk about, which are restorations, where you're putting back a previous leader uh, in power who was recently ousted, say by another foreign country or by a domestic uh, uprising. Those are the most benign. They don't increase the likelihood of civil war one way or the other. So this chapter has six case studies, kind of went overboard as I sometimes do. Um, three of them about military disintegration, which are Cambodia, Afghanistan, and Iraq. And three about the problem of competing principles. The first one is the previous uh, intervention in Afghanistan in 1839, the first one by the British who went in to remove uh, Dost Mohammed, who was the leader in Afghanistan, who they perceived as being too close to the Russians and putting in their own candidate. Uh, and that did not work out so well. That is the case where the, the British tried to leave and went over the pass and were ambushed uh, and killed almost to a man. And in that chapter, I look at a couple of other cases, including Guatemala in 1954, the US overthrow of Jacobo Arbenz. <clears throat> so chapter four, looks then at imposed leader survival, right? So what's the effect of coming to power uh, at, the, at the hands of a foreign power on the likelihood of being removed by force, right? You don't leave office in regular fashion, usually by elections. You leave at the point of a gun uh, or you're assassinated or you're thrown out of the country, something like that. We call that irregular removal. <laughs> it's a nice sanitized term for violence. The bottom line of this chapter is that leaders who are placed in power by outside interveners are a lot more likely to be removed by force uh, than other kinds of leaders. And the same pattern that I talked about with civil war is evident. Leadership regime changes are worst, institutional are somewhere in the middle, and restoration ones are more benign. In this chapter, there are a couple of case studies. One is about the US role in ousting uh, Diem in South Vietnam in 1963. And then what happens to his replacement, Duong Van Minh, who was a general uh, in the South Vietnamese army. Uh, the Americans thought he would have, he was a military man. He would go about fighting the war in the way the Americans wanted it to fight it. He had different ideas and he was facing pressures from the population who were sick of war. Uh, and uh, the Americans ended up uh, okay and signing off on a coup against him. The second case is the case that's on the cover of the book, which is uh, Emperor of Mexico Maximilian facing the firing squad in 1867 uh, after he is overthrown as the emperor by the previous occupant of the office, Benito Juarez. Lastly, chapter five looks at intervener and target conflict. Um, so what happens to the relations between the two states uh, afterwards, after regime change happens. We would expect things to get better, uh, and yet they don't, right? The bottom line across a large number of cases is that we don't see much movement in the needle. And in fact, the leadership regime changes uh, where simply placing a new leader in power actually increases the likelihood of militarized disputes between the two countries. The other ones don't, and we're actually restoring foreign leaders who had been previously out of power decreases that likelihood 
Why? Because of the kinds of cases that are there. So restoring democratic regimes that were ousted by Nazi Germany after World War II, right? Those are countries we have uh, no quarrel with. The domestic populations were perfectly happy to have their democratic regimes uh, return to power. So that mismatch of interests was not in play there. So the, there are circumstances where that divergence of interests is mitigated. Uh, the case studies in this chapter include uh, Rwanda and Uganda's overthrow of Joseph Mobutu uh, in 1997. They replaced him with a gentleman named Lauren Kabila, uh, largely to stop the Hutu genocidaires, former genocidaires from attacking back into Rwanda. Uh, within a few months, Kabila was in league with the same genocidaires supporting attacks back into Rwanda. The Rwandans attacked to try to remove him, do regime change part two, failed and then that's when you get the second world the second uh, the big world war of africa uh, and the other case study in this chapter is japan's assassination of chang so uh, chang so lin uh, in china in 1928. so that's the sort of broad overview of the book there's these two mechanisms about military disintegration and the sort of principal agent problem affecting civil war leader survival interstate outcomes. Let me just pull a few implications from this before closing. One is what I call easier is not easier. So for powerful countries, and a lot of these cases are in mismatched, really asymmetric kinds of relationships, a powerful state against a weaker state. Just because you can do regime change in those cases doesn't really mean you should do it. Um, we tend to focus kind of myopically on the carrying out of the regime change itself and think a lot less about what comes afterwards. Uh, and of course, that was that kind of thinking was evident uh, in the Iraq case uh, in 2003. Um, most of targets are not really posing large threats, and therefore the costs, uh, if they're significant at all, may outweigh the benefits of carrying out the regime change in the first place. Second implication is uh, about, got to really think in a clear-eyed way about threats. Most of these regime changes uh, were preceded by threat inflation. And that's just as true of Afghanistan in 1839 as it was in Iraq in 2003. Of course, we know a lot about the latter. In the former, it was that the Russians were going to somehow send troops over the Hindu Kush, take over Afghanistan, and threaten uh, India. Right. Uh, and this was just a little bit preposterous. Um, so again, it's is the threat really worth the potential cost of regime change? Third, if only we had done dot, dot, dot. Right? A lot of work on recent cases focuses on this or that policy decision and bemoans, oh, if we only hadn't uh, debothified so extensively in Iraq, if only we hadn't disbanded the Iraqi military. Yes, those are some big own goals uh, scored by the intervener against itself, but it, those kinds of, it's not just the policies that are implemented afterwards, it's the fundamental, uh, things more fundamental to the enterprise itself uh, that I argue is the key issue un underlying this. And last, to bring out this thread about different types of regime change, Restoring rather than changing the status quo works a little better. So bringing leaders back to power who had been ousted, say, by other foreign powers tends to work better uh, because uh, a lot of times those regimes were quite popular and restoring them doesn't have the same mismatch of interests. Post-World War II Western Europe uh, are cases of that nature. Uh, and that's kind of another way of saying that regime changes may be better for defense than for offense. So my colleague, Lindsay O'Rourke, in her book on covert regime change documents all of these attempts the United States did to covertly uh, target the Soviet Union and its allies uh, at the, early in the Cold War. And these just went nowhere because you're dealing with a formidable uh, adversary. Um, and in, in these cases, in our in the set of cases in my book, it's really about 
the costs of doing uh, regime change afterwards that tend to get sort of punted down the road uh, or ignored uh, and focusing on the sort of short-term benefit of eliminating uh, a leader that is a thorn in your side. So with that, I'll uh, wrap up and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Alex. Uh, so I'm David Edelstein, uh, Professor and Vice Dean at Georgetown. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, and full disclosure, uh, my, my relationship with Alex goes back to the, the snowy tundra of Hyde Park many years ago. Um, and uh, he's a longtime friend and colleague, and I'm thrilled to, to see this book and, and dare I say, um, proud that he's written. It's a very impressive um, piece of work and um, I encourage all of you to, to read it um, when you can. Um, so I think what we're, we're gonna do here is, um, I'm gonna, I have a few questions for Alex and I think we're gonna engage in a bit of a colloquy on, on some things. Um, and then I would encourage anybody who has questions um, to, for those of you who are, who may be new to Zoom still, um, uh, if you use the, the reactions bar, the reactions uh, logo in the bottom of your Zoom window, you can see a raise hand function there. And um, if you raise your hand, then I will, um, I will be sure to call on you after Alex and I are done um, in, a, in a, a few minutes here. Um, so Alex, you know, maybe I'll start with uh, what I think for many people, uh, you know, at least my experience on having written a, a book on a not totally dissimilar topic is, um, the kind of question number one is, you know, aha, but but what about Germany and Japan, right? Um, mm -hmm. Which everyone points to the kind of post World War II and, and before the Iraq invasion, everybody pointed to the cases of Germany and Japan as as these marvelous successes that should give us some confidence about doing um, these these types of operations in the future. So. Um, can you can you address question number one, right? Which is, you know, what what went right in Germany and Japan that has been so elusive in these other cases? Great question, right? Because those are the big examples, other than Iraq and Afghanistan, that come to mind for most Americans. Um, and the there are a number of differences, and there have been a number of of pieces that have been written on this, looking comparing the sort of preconditions. Uh, or existing conditions within those countries versus, say, the more recent cases. Uh, one has to do with uh, preconditions for regime transition or democratization. Um, from the comparative politics literature, we learn things like countries that have uh, relatively high per capita incomes, uh, uh, middle classes, economic preconditions are more likely to be able to democratize in a sustained way. Countries that are more ethnically homogeneous uh, also uh, have an advantage uh, in this regard. Um, so there's, and there was previous experience with democracy in Germany. The Weimar Republic had not been that long before. Um, so some previous experience with some kind of constitutional uh, regime. Then, there are things that may have been emphasized by people in this Zoom call, namely yourself in the book that's over your shoulder. Uh, it has to do with mitigating this interest gap, right? So my argument's principally about this divergence of interest between the intervener and the population that puts the leader in this difficult position. If you can mitigate that, that problem largely goes away. In those cases, there was this thing out there called the Soviet Union uh, that was menacing. You know, it had it was right there in Germany, and it had attacked Japan on the Asian mainland in the latter phases of World War II. Both countries, both of the, both the targets and the United States, perceived this as a common threat, and that helped persuade uh, those countries and the people who lived there that hey, you know, maybe. United States and this occupation is better than what we might experience at the hands of uh, the Soviet Union. So that helps to mitigate uh, the, the interest asymmetry. And last thing I'll say is the United States was willing to work with a lot of bad actors. It's not like we completely got rid of the elite uh, or people who had worked in the prior regimes as we tried to do uh, 
uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, we worked with a lot of former Nazis uh, and, and uh, folks involved in the Japanese regime, and that gave some continuity uh, from before to after. Great, thank you, Alex. Um, so another question for you is, uh, so as you noted, right, the kind of the, the world leader in regime change is the United States. And when the United States undertakes these types of operations, it, it is, um, and I'll, I'll try not to be too cynical here, right? It's, it's, it's at least um, kind of uh, notionally in the interest of, of promoting democracy in the, the countries where, um, uh, where regime change is, is being undertaken. And so my question for you is, how easily can you disentangle the, um, the challenges of regime change from the challenges of democratization, right? Is, is the problem actually trying to, trying to do democracy in these places, uh -huh. right? And if you just were willing to settle for, you know, and pick any other type of regime, you, you do better at this, right? So I imagine your data has something to say about this. I imagine your theory has something to say about this. And I'd be, I'd be curious to, to hear what you think. Yeah, it's a great question. So how do, yeah, as you said, how do we disentangle these things given that the United States has been doing them simultaneously, at least in a few cases? It turns out those cases are a distinct minority. So as I mentioned, the leadership regime changes in my data are by far the most common. There's, uh, they comprise more than 50% uh, of the cases. And you might be surprised to learn that democracies are not so great about promoting democracy when they do regime change. A previous piece of this project, uh, I looked at this question, what happens when democracies do regime change? Do you get democratization afterwards? And in only about less than a third of the cases did the United States or whoever else was doing it try actually to promote democracy by which I you know, meant holding free and fair elections, that, that kind of thing. So there have been long stretches of time where the United States wasn't interested in this, witnessed the Cold War. Um, and it is only post-Cold War that we have returned to this idea. Um, so that allows me <laughs> to sort of pull these apart. Uh, and the, the fact that the leadership cases the ones where you're basically promoting autocracy uh, without, without really supporting it, right? So uh, those are the ones that have the worst uh, outcomes. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that, thanks. Great, and so maybe one last question for you um, and then we'll turn it over to the, to the questions from the floor, which is, um, uh, and again, this is, <laughs> I draw that, that book over my shoulder there, right? Some, some experience from that that I think is probably pertinent to you as well, which is, you know, a question I got often, which I suspect you get sometimes, and, and I think is, is a reasonable question, right? Is, okay, as, as, as challenging as uh, these foreign imposed regime changes may be, and as awful as some of these outcomes that you're getting may be, it's still better than the alternative, right? It's still better than if you kind of had done nothing and let you know, whatever was there previously kind of continue on, right? And one of the things we both learned on the sunny south side of Chicago, right, is that international politics is often about choosing between really bad options, right? And that, in fact, can an argument be made in some of these cases that even as terrible as the outcome was, it was still better than what the outcome would have been had you done nothing. Yeah, so this is, this is, in a sense, one of the hardest questions to answer, as you know, yep. uh, because it involves getting at the counterfactual. By counterfactual, I mean this alternative universe where regime change had not been implemented in a country, and what would have happened uh, in that alternative universe. So since we can't compare a country to itself having experienced both of those outcomes at the same time. So one has to come up with uh, some way of estimating that counterfactual. So I'll answer this question in two parts. One is I did a bunch of things to try and mitigate that problem or try to at least get at it. One is to look at, probably the most important one is to try and look at cases that are as similar as possible in as many ways 
to the cases that do experience regime change, but that did not. Uh, and then estimate across a bunch of cases whether regime change still, when compared to those most similar cases, has an effect. And it, I find that it does. Um, so there's, you know, that's one way I try to deal with this issue uh, in general. Another way to think about this is sometimes regime change is, is, you know, nearly mandatory. So World War II is probably as close as we come to that case. There was no way the world was going to live with Adolf Hitler remaining in charge of Germany uh, after what happened between 1933 and 1945. Uh, and so Unconditional surrender, that's what was going to happen. Uh, the destruction of the Nazi regime and something being rebuilt in its place. Most regime changes are not like that. There are wars of choice where there's some uh, disagreement, not, not to minimize it, but there's a, there's a real disagreement there. There may be a perception of threat, um, but a lot of times that threat is kind of minimal. Great cases, for example, uh, Iran and Guatemala, 1953 and 1954. The British put the bug in the Americans here in 1952-53 that Mossadegh was a communist sympathizer, that the country was in danger of falling to the communists and therefore to the Soviet Union and its sphere of influence. This was mostly nonsense. Uh, the communist uh, two-day party was pretty small, uh, and there wasn't any indication that it was going to seize power or that Mossadegh was going to let them uh, or bring them into power. So the threat there is inflated. Similarly in Guatemala, Jacobo Arbenz comes in, he implements much needed land reform. And he says, who's my biggest idol? FDR. Right? What we need is, you know, social programs to deal with the inequality in this country. Um, but this is viewed in Washington as socialist, socialism, communist sympathizing, uh, even though the Communist Party, yes, he was friendly with some communists, but there were 500 communists in the Communist Party in Guatemala. And so the idea that this was, you know, leaving them alone was gonna result in some kind of disaster uh, is, uh, a little bit beyond, um, you know, and you could, you know, people argue about the 2003 case. There were people who were in favor of the war because of the WMD question, others who were opposed, who could still continue to contain Saddam, who wasn't much of a threat. I tended to be in that latter camp. Um, uh, but, you know, trying to think about what would have happened um, is, is a hard question. Um, I just add one one thing here. Um, you know, some regime changes have had real beneficial consequences. Uh, two cases, for example, where genocide was was halted when the Vietnamese invaded Cambodia and removed Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge, and in the same year when Tanzania overthrew Idi Amin. But in both cases, that effect was completely beside the point for the intervener. So it had a good effect, but the reason Vietnam decided to remove Pol Pot was that the Cambodians kept attacking Vietnam, similarly with Idi Amin. So they, were cared, they cared primarily about what they wanted, um, less so the humanitarian uh, effects or consequences. So that, you know, some argue that may be changing over time uh, and countries may be more willing to intervene and do regime change for humanitarian purposes. If so, we haven't really seen it yet, I would argue. Great, thank you, Alex. Uh, so we have about 15 minutes for questions and uh, I'll open up to the floor. Uh, what I would ask, I'll, I'll call on you, if, if you could just uh, introduce yourself before you before you ask your question. Um, I think uh, Dean Ayres might also have a, a question. We might lead off with her. Uh, she just put her hand up and I will I will do give the the, the Dean the prerogative. Uh, happy, happy to do that. Uh, Dean Ayres, if you wanted to kick us off. Thank you. Um, Alex, congratulations again on really a tremendous book. I mean, this is it's so detailed and you've marshaled so many different cases uh, to build a quite persuasive argument. Um, in many ways, your book is a call for more diplomacy. There are a lot of people who would argue that diplomacy doesn't 
often get the outcomes one might like to see? How would you answer that? I think in many ways you're right. And I think from your background that uh, it's interesting that you take away that lesson. So one, you know, one lesson to take away from books like mine, books like uh, Professor Edelstein's and others who've worked on this subject is that these kind of interventions are hard and they don't succeed very often, but nothing succeeds very often. We live in a hard world. Uh, there's no magic bullet and people are reluctant to, to take that message to heart. So yeah, diplomacy is, is hard. You sometimes get nice uh, victories such as I would consider the 2015 JCPOA uh, to have been one of those diplomatic achievements arms control between the Russians and the Soviets during, excuse me, the Soviets and the Americans during the Cold War. Um, but, you know, diplomacy succeeds about as often as economic sanctions, succeeds about as often as regime change, occupation, foreign aid, lots of these things. So we have a lot of bows, there are arrows in the quiver, but each of them has a relatively low chance of, of hitting the target. But they, what they, where they vary, I would argue, is in the consequences uh, of failure, uh, of it not succeeding. So regime change can get you involved in 10, 20 year occupations with a lot of death and destruction and a trillion dollars or so out the door. So it's just those costs that policymakers ought to be aware of that this is not a tool that uh, is costless and can somehow be implemented uh, easily. Great, thanks, Alex. Uh, so let me go now to uh, John McAuliffe. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I'm the head of a small NGO called the Fund for Reconciliation and Development. Worked for a long time on Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, and now mostly work on Cuba. Um, Cambodia, I would throw, wonder if there aren't really two regime changes. One was the Vietnamese one that brought Heng Sam Rin and Hun Sen to power. Mm -hmm. And then the U.S. tried with the Europeans to do a second regime change through the U.N. agreement or the Paris agreement, which eventually fell on its face and Hun Sen came back power, but then the irony of the whole thing is that Hun Sen allies himself closer to the Chinese, driving the Vietnamese absolutely crazy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, where, the, where regime change leads is unpredictable. I'd also wonder how much you have dealt with the consequences for populations, Libya being the key in my mind as to who really ends up winning from a liberal regime change uh, undertaken. And the final thing I, I pointed out in the chat that there's a whole other category of Cuba is the example of failed regime change that has dominated US policy for 60 years in totally counterproductive ways, both for the Cubans and for us. So just a couple of comments. I, the book sounds fascinating though, and very important. Well, thank you. I appreciate those comments. Um, I'll just make, a, I guess, a couple of remarks. I mean, your, your, your comment about unpredictability uh, after regime change is, is completely apt. Um, and you know, who would have thought that the United States would recognize the Khmer Rouge as the legal government of Cambodia for a decade or so uh, after the Vietnamese overthrew them, even though they were a murderous regime, um, simply because we were so angry and bitter about the Vietnam War. Um, effect of, of regime change on populations. I mean, this is another, uh, another area for research. I've done a little bit of work on the economic uh, outcomes after regime change. I found that actually trade does declines but after regime changes by the United States and Latin America very unexpected uh, finding, um, but I haven't gotten too far on other effects, but you can imagine my argument would be, of course, these leadership regime changes are gonna have a poor effect or a negative effect on well-being uh, of populations. Uh, and you're exactly right on Cuba, right? 
the starting with the Eisenhower administration and moving forward, um, the United States tried on many occasions uh, from Bay of Pigs through assassination attempts uh, to uh, you know, making Cuba a pariah state and so forth uh, to remove that regime uh, and just was unable to do so. And here we are 60 years later with policies still in place uh, that seem to me anyway, uh, counterproductive and out of place. Thanks, Alex. Uh, so next I have Nick Anderson. Hi, Nick. Hi, hey, good to see you. Alex, congratulations on the book. Uh, my name is Nick Anderson. I teach here at the Elliott School. So my question is, um, it's sort of curious that you have, you know, the US, well, not curious that you have the US as a repeat offender, but the, the sort of act of repeat offense is sort of strange, as you point out in the book and document, this is uh, costly, complex policies that, that are uh, fail more often than they succeed. Um, I guess my question is why we keep trying this and why do countries keep trying this? And I, it may be outside the scope of the, of the book, but I'm sure you've thought a lot about it. Um, are we gonna stop now that we have this book, now that we have all this evidence that, <laughs> that it doesn't work? I guess, yeah, that's my question. Why do you think countries keep trying when it's so difficult? Yeah, so this is one, you know, obvious question to take away from a book like this, which is, uh, Professor Downs, if things are, you know, as dire as they seem in terms of consequences, outcomes from, from this, uh, from this type of thing, why does it keep happening? Why do countries keep doing it? Uh, in particular, why does the United States uh, keep doing it? Although plenty of other countries have as well. There's a lot of things that go into this. Uh, and I'll just highlight uh, a few. One is um, countries, and I think the United States too, and this may be more prevalent in democracies, tend to focus on the task at hand. Like, okay, how are we gonna do the regime change itself? What's our military plan? How are we gonna do it? Um, uh, you know, what's the strategy? How many troops? Can we do it at a low cost? And uh, what comes afterwards, manana. Maybe, maybe we've got somebody that we'll bring in and we'll plop them down and that will they'll live happily ever after. Maybe somehow we'll uh, bring some institutions in. But it, the, what the military calls phase four is kind of left. Uh, and it was particularly egregious in, in the Iraq case uh, where DOD was put in charge of this. Uh, and of course, Donald Rumsfeld didn't want to have anything to do with it. But this is not just, you know, isolated to the 2003 case. Um, it's a lot of wishful thinking, I think, sort of what political scientists would call motivated bias or psycho psychologists would call motivated bias. Well, we really wanna do this, so it's gonna be easy and the aftermath will be good because uh, we need to do it. Uh, second thing is, is the use of military strategies designed to induce collapse. So the United States uses what you might call blitzkrieg kinds of tactics to penetrate, uh, enemy military forces induce them to collapse and disintegrate, not really realizing that that's sort of a prime ingredient to resistance. The third thing is that's really prominent over time is either the lack of intelligence or the intelligence you have is biased because you're getting it from people who are either exiles who have been out of the country for many years, don't really know a lot about what's going on, and or they have a vested interest in you doing regime change. So they come and whisper sweet nothings in your ear. This was, uh, this occurred in the case that's on the cover of the book in Maximilian. The com Mexican conservatives came over to Europe and convinced Napoleon III that, oh yes, yes, there's much, there's a great deal of sympathy in Mexico for a monarchy. Uh, and this helped convince Maximilian to take this on. Um, we don't think about interest asymmetries. We, in the, in the American case, I think we tend to think that people, er, people everywhere think like we do, and they're gonna want what we want. Uh, and the idea that there might be a divergence uh, between those two tends not to occur to us. Um, there's et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, those are things that you know, sort of stick out uh, over time. Thanks, Alex. Um, so I think we only have have time for for one more question that I'm going to there has been some in the, the chat that I'm going to kind of discern a question out of for you, Alex, which is, 
the, the one that I want to kind of pick up on is the, the question about um, the Arab Spring, mm. um, and which I think is an interesting kind of kind of set of cases to look at, right? I mean, it's it it it's one where you kind of imagine the U.S. and others kind of standing by and watching, right, as these these kind of changes um, kind of took place. And I, um, I wonder if you you kind of have a comment, you know, with the exception of Libya, obviously. I mean, if if you have a comment on kind of on the Arab Spring, right? And if, if you've sort of tried to connect your research at all to what we saw in the Arab Spring, is, is the lesson there that regime change in any case is really hard? It's even harder if you're going to try and do it from outside in a kind of military way. Yes, this is a, this is a great question. And the answer, the short answer is yes. Regime change of any kind is hard. Leaders that come to power violently are much more likely to leave power violently. Uh, it's the exception where violent transitions come to stable outcomes. Much more, it's much more the rule that they uh, they end up in the same way that they started. Um, when I was presenting this some years ago, uh, one someone asked me a question. And says, "Well, why you know why just foreign and post regime change? Why not just all regime change?" Um, my answer was. I don't know, somewhat unsatisfyingly to the person because I'm interested in what happens when foreigners do this. Now, it shares a lot of similarities in terms of outcomes with what can happen from domestic only coups, revolutions, and so forth. But it adds this missing piece, right? We're interested, it's a, it's a huge policy question and a, and a big question over time is whether outsiders can, can change other countries. And so what I'm trying to highlight is this uh, factor that has been somewhat overlooked. Others have focused on it in other areas like security force assistance, that there's not always a, a, a matching interest between the, what the intervener want and what's the, what the leader wants about building the military. Uh, and bringing it to this case uh, and showing that that helps, uh, contributes to this disorder problems lack of success uh, in this particular set of cases. But yeah, one could easily write a book, it would be an even longer book than I wrote, that links uh, these cases together. You could look at revolutions, you could look at coups, you could look at uh, all manner of uh, violent, or you know, variation in, uh, as I do, it, variation in, in types of regime change and look at which ones end up uh, in a more stable way. Great, thanks, Alex. Uh, and maybe with that, I will turn it back to, to Dean Ayers. I don't know if you had any kind of final comments you wanted to make, uh, but um, thank you, Alex, and thank you everybody in the audience for your, your really interesting question. You know, I had hoped that we would be in person. And of course, here we are now with Omicron that's taken us away from, we were getting to hybrid uh, book launches last semester, which was so nice because we could be together in person and congratulate uh, the author uh, and celebrate the new book. Um, doing this virtually is not as much fun, but it's what we have right now. So let me just congratulate you again on having this out. This really is a tremendous accomplishment. Uh, and I do hope that we will be able to see you uh, talk about this with policymakers, because I think you've got a really important lesson here. I mean, there is this constant push and pull in Washington about uh, 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 budgets and funding and defense and how we think about foreign policy and national security. And you've made a very strong argument for uh, taking much more um, advantage of the different kinds of tools in the toolkit, uh, diplomacy and economic sanctions and other forms of persuasion and coercion. Uh, other than regime change. So I know everyone here, we've had about 100 people uh, joining us for this conversation today, which was nice to see. I'm sure everyone will join me in congratulating you again. And we hope that you sell a lot of copies uh, and that this goes uh, on course adoptions and many different people's syllabi across different disciplines.